Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for tuning in to our Caribbean American Holiday Cuisine session. I have some awesome guests um, with me today. So go ahead, get settled, get those questions prepared um, because we'll also be taking live questions as well during this time. Okay. All right, so without further ado, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Simone Kendall, and I'm the Deputy Public Affairs Officer here at the U.S. Embassy in Bridgetown. Um, today, we'll be featuring some Caribbean cuisine and just meeting and interviewing with three chefs who are excited to be here with you all and excited to hear some of your questions. So thank you again for tuning into Caribbean American Holiday Cuisine. Um, and so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and do some introductions so you all can meet some of our special guests. So first up, I want you to meet Chef Sean Benjamin. Um, so he is a Brooklyn-based chef and is proof that life is not necessarily linear. Um, he is a St. Lucian-born chef who left the island in his late teens and studied finance um, at New York's Mercy College, eventually making his mark as a successful stockbroker. Um, and as, as we all know, life changes. And so he actually, during the turbulent times of the global financial crisis in 2008, kind of gave up that space and reacquainted himself with culinary skills. So thank you so much, um, Chef Sean, for being with us. Um, he is one of our, one of three special guests that we have here today. Um, thank you again for being a part of this session. Yeah. Thank yes, you for thank being you. here. It's a good opportunity. I'm on the panel also. It's been honored to be here and I feel great. Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are, and season greetings. Yes, yes. So next up, without further ado again, I want to introduce you all to... Let's see. I know I got two options, <laughs> too many choices. <laughs> so, I'm going with Chef Austin Williams, um, thank you so much for being a part of this session today. I can't wait to hear more about your. Yes, um, but Chef Ralston Williams was born on the island of St. Vincent in the Grenadines, raised in Brooklyn, and trained at the French Culinary Institute. Chef Williams offers an elevated, forward-looking, and forward-thinking take on Caribbean classics. Um, and after immigrating to New York at 10 years old and living in the East Flatbush neighborhood of Brooklyn, he studied theology at Oakwood University in Alabama. Yes, yes. So while <laughs> hey, based on Season greetings to everyone. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So as he is, Chef Williams is constantly experimenting with new flavor combinations and different projects. We look forward to hearing more about some of the upcoming projects you have and sharing those with us all today. Um, so thank you again, Chef Chef Williams, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And so last but not least, we have Mayma Raphael. So everybody meet Mayma. Um, she is a food blogger. <laughs> Growing up in Dominica, food was central to socializing and in abundance. Cooking with family was one of the highlights of her youth. She grew up um, around produce and raising livestock super interesting and kind of making often making that all to the kitchen table um, with your mother and her grandmother's guidance she's discovered a new passion starting cooking at the age of nine so um, i invite her to share her experiences from the caribbean island of dominica and i look forward to a wonderful session so thank you all for being here it is a pleasure to be able to highlight caribbean food and for you all to share some of the american influences you've kind of been able to inject into some of your cuisine as well um, so as we get started i kind of want to start with a a kicker kickoff question um, just starting if you all could share some of your influences on your cuisine and your cooking style. So since I introduced Mema last, if you could go ahead and just share some of your influences um, that you've influenced into your cooking. Sure, Simone, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here this morning with this absolutely amazing panel. Um, you know, to be among the chefs 
professionally trained chefs. I don't consider myself a chef. I do consider myself a cook. Um, but um, just so happy for this wonderful opportunity and to talk about my experiences in Dominica. Well, um, a few things influence my cooking. Fundamentally, my cooking is highly influenced, of course, by my upbringing on the nature island. Um, hence the name of my blog, Dominica Gourmet. At a very young age, I was blessed to have the guidance of my mother and grandmother, and that helped crystallize my vision and just set me in my way. Mind you, though, um, this experience isn't unique just to me. Most cooks in Dominica are influenced by their bringing, especially on the matriarchic side of the family. Um, mm. During community events, like what is commonly known in Dominica as Cool May or Monjune, where people work on projects, um, you know, you have, you know, um, the host offering food to people as, as a form of gratitude, right? So you'd see the village cooks come together and mainly the women really preparing some of the favorite and traditional dishes. As a matter of fact, I don't know any Dominican who can't cook. So we definitely <laughs> learned. <learn to cook. laughs> and I often saw my mother and grandmother prepare very complex dishes yet to make it seem so effortless. And so I developed a passion for cooking and the love is what drives me. I've also been fortunate to travel the world. You know, I visited quite a few countries and have paid close attention to food and food presentation. I often um, am inspired by some of the techniques. I've also, you know, come to the realization that using products that are local to the community to not only enhance the food, but also it makes it just more um, create that connection, right, to the food and the community that you serve. I often use banana and in my in my um, cooking, and that's something like banana leaves and stuff. Anyway, I'm also really influenced by the ingredients that we use. So I visit the farmers market and, of course, um, the herb markets and okay. butchers and all this. <laughs> so really, I I am there's a, a really eclectic mix of my influence, which is rooted and centralized in my upbringing in Dominica. Mm, yes, awesome. thank you so much. Yeah, that is super awesome. And I, I love that you touched on kind of the influence of your family and the environment that you were brought up in. Um, it is one thing that I keep finding and speaking to you all and just doing more research in terms of cuisine and food and where it comes from, um, that food is not just food that we eat. It's um, a form of storytelling that is tied to our histories, to our backgrounds. And like one of the things that really does truly link us all together in some form, our fashion. Um, Chef Ralston, would you go ahead and share some of like your influences in your cuisine and cooking style? Um, sure, I'd be happy to. Um... It's first of all, it's really an awesome privilege to be here and to be considered like making some level of uh, cuisine of uh, what have you. For me, it's just really w me putting myself on a plate and people accepting it, which is kind of like surprising, right? So, as a young boy, um, and and just like Mema, my story is not unique in any way. So, my mom left me when I was three years old with her friend expected to come back from me uh, maybe in a few months while she came to the States. Immigration papers took forever, took seven years before I saw my wow. mom again, right? So within that time, you have where I'm being raised by my aunt, which is my mother's best friend, but I call her auntie, who, you know, she taught me how to cook certain things. However, um, she was often bedridden, right? So she's sick and has uh, ailments. And so at five, six years old, which is not uncommon, I'm cooking meals, right? So out of the house, out of the window, she's yelling greetings out the window to me while I'm running back and forth, um, <laughs> making a meal. You know, I was raised a uh, Seventh-day Adventist. So we, you know, you have your Sabbath meals and you have other Friday preparations and things like that. And so like, I, I was the one that did that. My neighbor uh, made chocolate. She would roast uh, the beans and we would uh, grind them and, and sell them for cocoa tea in the morning. Um, uh, she would make butter. We, I mean, it's, a, it's just a lot of different things that, you know, that we all experienced growing up in some ways, some of us stop, we pay attention to it and, and incorporated them in our food. So 
you know, quick, quick thing is like when I came to the States, it was always, hey, cereal stays uh, crunchy in your milk. And for me, it, it always got soggy. And I always wondered why did it get soggy in my milk? And everyone else's milk, it was, it was, it was really still crunchy. And not understanding that, okay, my milk was warm and everyone else's was cold because we got our milk every morning right from the cow. We'll scald it and we'll just put it in our cereal, right? So I still continue doing that when I came to the States. However, in the States, you know, people drink cold milk, which I think is kind of gross, but, um, but that's what they do. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and so that's part of the influences of, of my cooking. I don't want to take up too much time with Sean. Yes, no, thank you for that too. And it it does make me think back to like some of the childhood experiences of like where I've been influenced by like my cooking style or two, I love that you said it's bringing yourself to the plate. Love it, love it, yeah, love it. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> Chef Sean, like, do you have any insights um, that you like to share about um, in terms of your influences or um, your cooking style? Where did it come from? We'll get back to Chef Sean, but Mayma, um, one thing that you mentioned is in terms of like your international experience. Um, do you have, um, are you able to see any linkages between Caribbean food and some of the things that we identify as American cuisine? Oh, wow. You know, <laughs> although food is sometimes viewed through the lens of cultural identity, food also transcend cultures, boundaries, and help create fusion you know, mixes that add eclectic blends of dining experiences. I'm sure Chef Sean and um, and Chef Ralston can relate, you know, uh, in a nutshell, really, food travels. And so mm -hmm. on both sides of the border, I would say that, for instance, um, you know, you have the Caribbean side where we have migration, right? And we have people moving into North America and bringing their authentic selves, and also bring in the ingredients and bring in the dishes that they have gotten to love and it's part of the identity. Like when Dominicans travel to, for instance, New York, they find, you know, the local Caribbean store and make sure that, you know, they have their pumpkin to make their pumpkin soup or their tripe to add to it or, you know, whatever, the bull food, you know, we find all sources, right? And, mm -hmm. and you know, add to that eclectic blend. Right. And then you have also a lot of restaurants like Chef Chef Ralston's restaurant, who not only caters to a Caribbean um, clientele, but also create caters to a wider spectrum within the New York area, which makes it even more appealing, right? And 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 kind of transcends that cultural market and goes right into the mainstream market. You know, you have ingredients like jerk that has made a, a, a really book big footprint in the US. Um, you have chains like even, you know, Cheesecake Factory offering Rasta Pasta, which of course the word is controversial, but uh, <laughs> offering spices, offering jerk, offering those things. And at the local, you know, school, you have beef patties, you have beef patties. Mm -hmm. So they have become mainstream. All foods have become mainstream because we have pockets of Caribbean people Florida, you have Julia's Kitchen, you have your local Caribbean restaurants in the very Caribbean um, locations within the U.S., especially in New York, Philadelphia, and those metropolitan areas. But then we also have foods going back to the Caribbean, like, of course, burgers and French fries, which we have adopted. So mm. the influence goes both ways. When you talk about linkage, it's definitely a mutual appreciation of of foods across the borders. Exactly, exactly. Um, so Chef Sean, um, can you share, in terms of influences, can you share a little bit of some of your your influence and your cooking style and the cuisine that you make? Uh, my influences pretty much stem from just being in the US and coming from culinary school. I actually went to the culinary school same as Royston, um, which is French Culinary Institute. Um, and for me, Going there, just having to getting the training of, of a professional chef, like I had the basics of just being from my grandmother, traditional cooking flavors. And me being at the culinary school was just being introduced to different styles, French, some Italian. And for me, it was just me receiving that information and the techniques and just trying to bring it back to the Caribbean. More or less, they showed me something French or Italian, but somehow translated to a Caribbean version of it. And that was just me pushing the envelope 
of identifying my style of cooking, which is called New York's Caribbean cuisine. And it, it just gave me birth where, yeah, everybody wanted to be a master of Italian or French cooking, but I myself just wanted to just take Caribbean cuisine to the next level, just to more of a, a contemporary approach more than in the traditional presentation. And that's just been a goal of mine, just pushing and just keeping the foundation of flavor, but just reinventing it. I would say like, as years comes by, you have to try to, I quote unquote, sell the Caribbean differently. And in the different times, just like not as TikTok, no, you can't sell your, you can sell your, your, your tradition, but also refine it. And that's been just been my goal for a long time now. For the last 11 years, I've been dedicated to doing that. Congratulations. Yeah, that's a long time. It's a long time, yeah. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so as you were talking about like keeping those traditions and also expanding those and elevating them, um, we got to tie in the holiday part. So I would love to hear some of the traditions you all have from St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dominica. Like, I would love to hear those because I haven't had the full experience. I've been to Dominica <laughs> once. I haven't made it to St. Lucia and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So you got to share some of those holiday traditions with myself and our viewers today. Wow. Okay. All right. right. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go first because I don't have, I don't have um, much. For me, uh, this is a big deal in the Caribbean, and um, especially being my grandmother being the head of the family at the time, um, and she was she was actually a chef on her own restaurant and guest house in St. Lucia, and okay. Christmas was special where it was just not just about your immediate family it was the community because, like, by any means necessary, she would we had this deep breach and she would keep at full because not only for us, but people come by, like mm. stop by and eat food. And, and, and it always an essence to me, right? Recognizing that food, food brings food, um, food brings people together, especially the holiday times in the Caribbean. And something that she always was marvel about was doing, a, I would say, take pride in was a ham, a salted ham. Like that was like perfection. And it's like, <laughs> from the ham to the black cake she's soaking the fruits almost for like six months and just getting ready for Christmas because it was a big celebration it was like that was magical to me and coming here and just reflecting on how Christmas is and it's so funny like last year I did this whole with the whole pandemic I did this whole Christmas menu and I was just trying to be offered something because the whole pandemic is it just brought me how Christmas is. And I just wanted to add some joy to people and just me sacrificing my time and just exploring my cooking for that. And from the sorrows, um, man, I remember I had a, a, a funny story in sorrow because sometimes there's the, the virgin um, version of it and there's the alcohol version of it. And I remember I got, <laughs> I got, um, they gave me the wrong version, and I went up riding my bike, and it was bad. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> but, uh, Sorry. but but for me, it, it, Christmas is a great a dear time, and again, it's just seeing how food brings people together. And my grandma wrote, not just serving our immediate family, but the community. And oh, yeah. how could I forget something that's very traditional that must have pastels. Pastels is like almost like a, a coconut, like a, a cornmeal cake with, with meat in it, which is okay. it's boiling and it's boiling a banana leaf. Yeah, that's like a must a staple. And yeah. when you have when it's made, you keep you have to keep it in the freezer for like at least ten of them. Just hide it. <laughs> <laughs> so just hide it. <laughs> Because it's a long process, and I'm watching my grandma make it up to today. Like that, I wish I learned how to make it, and it's such a process and tedious. Um, but for sure, that was joy for me. Oh, look at that! The magical saying. I'm getting hungry just hearing <laughs> all this. All right, yeah. but Chevron, I know you already wanted to to share some of the some of the traditions. What were you going to highlight? So what I was going to highlight has to do with the fact of the the way I was raised was not really based on Christmas. So Christmas for me, 
takes is viewed through a different lens. So we did a lot of caroling, right? Uh, we did a, we went a lot door to door and, 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 and kind of saying at people's doors, they'll give you money, you'll use the money for the community or something like that, right? And then another thing was black cake, right? So of course, we didn't use like rum or anything growing up, right? So um, we would set the fruits up in like grape juice, Welch's grape juice or something like that, right? However, now, of course, now I use rum, but back then it was like that, right? <laughs> um, I mean, you, yeah. and Sean, Sean, Sean says uh, that they had like, um, you know, you'll have the virgin uh, uh, sorrow and then, and then you have the one that's uh, spiked or what have you, right? For us, you know, for me, it's like, I used to want the sorrel to get old. So like, you'll take some and put it in the back of the fridge so that it can ferment on its own. So it's not really alcohol, right? It's kind of like that, right? It's a way mm -hmm. to cheat a little bit, right? Um, but another tradition is that my grandparents, on the other hand, they ate a lot of meat. Oh, by the way, I, I grew up vegetarian. So I didn't eat meat until I came to this country, really. Wow. Yeah. So, I'm gonna ask so that too. keep going. We're going to, I'm pinning that. <laughs> so, so yeah, I grew up vegetarian. So I didn't really eat meat. So my grandparents, um, they would always get a piglet in January and they'll raise it. And then on like maybe, yeah, maybe around this time, they will slaughter it and they'll keep some and give some to their friends and the neighborhood and that kind of thing. That was kind of the tradition. Oh, you could, it goes both ways. It could be like a cow or a big fat ram or something, but some kind of animal that is, been, is being raised and that's the Christmas animal. Like, like most of why you why I think of when I think of the uh, the food sermon, part of that has to do with um, the tradition of selling meat at Christmas time. Like everyone's a butcher on every island around Christmas time. If you went to St. Lucia right now and you're driving by, you're gonna see these stalls of just people with meat selling meat at the side of the road, and that's how it is in the in many islands too. And it's, it's the same way. Um, uh, so. Yeah, that's the that's the tradition that I see. It's all about community coming together. Even the rich or the poor, or what have you, at Christmas mm -hmm. time, you know, that food, you know, it's like a it's it's it, it's a level playing field there, you know. Mm -hmm. Mayma. Okay. Oh yes, absolutely. Well, you know, you guys are taking me way down memory lane, and I'm feeling this sense of nostalgia right now because. Of course, I'm not in Dominica right now to enjoy all the festivities, but I have to tell you that I had the most wonderful Christmas experiences in Dominica sure from, you. you know, months ahead when my parents would be soaking the fruits and for the fruitcake. In Dominica, we don't call it black cake. We call it fruitcake. And, and look, me, look, look, look. Oh, oh nice. <laughs> Of course. <laughs> and, then, and then we would even make our own wines, you know, make some um, plantain mm -hmm. wines, passion fruit wines, and would have that fermenting for a very long time. But Christmas time, we're ready to celebrate. Sorrel, of course. Sorrel trees are loaded with sorrel, and we have to go through the sorrel, picking the sorrel and getting our little fingers, you know, with the little um, prickle. Little, little yeah, prickle. Oh. Mm -hmm. But we would absolutely love this ginger beer. That was a major part of the Ooh. Christmas yeah, Christmas yeah. celebration as well. You can't miss the ginger beer, you know. Yeah. And it it went beyond that. Like in Dominica, we have what we call eggnog or chaudeau. Um, okay. It's like French, you know, for eggnog. But some of it was spiked and some of it was virgin, like you guys said of the sorrel. So we definitely enjoy that through Christmas time, especially when the carolers would come in or we would go caroling. Um, that would be part of the whole experience. You know, you have the cake, we call it gâteau. Or um, of course we give pound cake or, fru or fruit cake. And then the cows, the goats, the sheep, the pig. That was amazing because of course we have to have our tripe, our boudin, which is black pudding. Um, you know, those things were shared among community members. You know, um, you would go to the neighbor's house, like Ralston said, and you would get your pound of goat meat, and then you would perhaps exchange for a pound of cow meat, or you'd get the tripe or the intestine to make soup. Uh, it was just such a fulfilling experience, and the experience going from door to door to everyone's home to drink some ginger wine or drink some sorrel and celebrate the season, 
That was the major part of it, the community, the love. And in Dominica, we share a lot. I mean, we are passionate about sharing and giving. And at Christmas time, it's highly amplified. So I'm just feeling so touching right now, just thinking Aww. about those wonderful memories. And that my kids, of course, will, uh, I'm trying to recreate it here, but it's not the same. But I'm telling you, ah. those, those were great moments in a great community. They yeah. seem like it. And thank you all so much for sharing all, all of those personal stories of just your upbringings, the times that you spent with your family, from the care link to the community time that was spent. And that's the one thing that kept universally you all have mentioned is the sense of community and the holiday being a time of that, whether it's the sharing of food or sharing of songs. Um, I think that that is so important. And even takes me back to to some of the, the childhood experiences I've had, um, even in the making of wine. Like my family, they weren't um, big drinkers at all, but my grandfather would always go and make peach wine and all these different wines. I still remember that. Um, but as we've been talking about food um, so much, can you all tell me some of your favorite dishes that you make during the holiday season? And then too, I'm gonna add to that by also wondering if you can kind of share a special ingredient or a sauce or something that kind of makes it unique. Sure. Who's up first? I feel I like I heard Emma. <laughs> you know, in Dominica, definitely the Christmas table is filled with a lot of goodies, including the ham that Sean talked to Chef Sean talked about. Um, the, the ham to perfection, right? That lasts for the entire season into into the New Year, because of course you have to use different parts of the ham. You know, the bone, the skin, the the fat, the, the everything, right? Um, and then, you know, the, the Christmas table is filled with the tradition, like the codfish, you know, perhaps acra. But one thing that I really enjoyed during the holiday season was sauce. And when I say sauce, I'm talking about, it could be the foie chien sauce, which is the skin of the cow. Um, it could also be bullfoot sauce, which is from the feet of the cow as well. But one that is dear to my heart is the pig feet sauce. And when I say sauce, Simone, I'm not sure if, whether you're familiar with sauce, but it's like a pickled um, meat. It could be, of course, we said the skin of the cow, the feet of the cow. And that pickled meat is seasoned to perfection. You know, there's um, spicy pepper, hot, hot peppers, garlic, um, lime, or you could use lemon and parsley and chive or green onions and onions. But the secret to making the best sauce, especially Dominican sauce, is to boil the sauce with garlic. You know, you boil it, my mom always said, you boil it with a lot of garlic. It not only tenderizes it, the pig feet, or, you know, the bullfoot feet, the, the, the cow feet, but it also gives it a flavor all the way to the bone. And then, in Dominica, we don't recycle the water that we use to boil the sauce. We use fresh water, okay. fresh water, and we it's crisp and clean and refreshing. So that's the secret to making great sauce. And of course, lots of pepper, lots of garlic, and lots of lime. Okay. Okay. I do it every year, every holiday season, and my kids now they love it. So. Oh, I look, it's all tradition. family tradition. Okay. Standard. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Chef Rawson, did you have a, a special? Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> go with Sean. Go with Sean. No, no. I, have, I have a little audio issue. No, you're fine. We can hear you. We can hear you, well, Sean. Well, the question is, I, I didn't hear the question. This is the audio issue. Um, oh, um, yeah. Can you hear me now, though? Like when somebody speaks, like it almost sounds really muffled. So I'm not hearing what direction you question is coming from. Um, but since we, from the gist of what I'm getting from um, the question is Christmas. I don't know. I can't. Can you hear me? I can't hear you guys. Yes, can you? yes we can hear you clearly, Sean. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite um, for, dish for me, that for you Christmas, like to during the holidays? Um, See, I'm a little lost because I'm not sure what the question is. Uh, can, I can hear you. What was the question? The favorite dish from the holiday season. My favorite dish? Is that what it is? That's what mm -hmm. it is? Yep. 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 <laughs> oh, man. Um, if I have to go based on the favorite dish, um, 
one thing I would say is my grandmother's mac and cheese for Christmas time. And even today I use this as my as my best mac and cheese I could ever have. And I think the secret for that is I could give it is just after you boil your noodles, um, just grating some fresh onions in there. And that gives it a, such a different flavor profile and mixing the different cheeses. Like for me right now, some fresh, my grandma, um, my grandma used to put the, the, a cheese from New Zealand named Anchor. And that's one of my signature cheeses Anchor. I put in there. Anchor. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you got to have the anchor cheese. <laughs> you got to have the anchor. <laughs> and, and, and for me, it's just the season that moves with fresh garlic and, and the black pepper. And, the, and It's almost making a cache pepe, but with mac and cheese where you bake it. It's, and for now, I actually put seven cheeses in my mac and cheese. And that's my Oh, last. my God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's like... So, like I fifty dollars a slice or something. <laughs> sounds, sounds delicious. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's very decadent and creamy, and I like. I, I I think that alone is is is, is just bring me back to my grandmother's table and to have to wait for that mac and cheese. And <laughs> it's so funny. Like just preparing for the show today, I was just reflecting on last Christmas where I did a Christmas menu and kind of got emotional where, you know, you you put yourself out there where you just want to, as I said before, make somebody else happy with cooking. And during the pandemic, how it was crazy, some people emotional, people can visit family. And I offered to just cook and whoever was interested, because at this point, you really, I want to say use the word depression, but you just want to add some joy. and. Mm-hmm. And I look at right now, it's just me being true to myself, how I cook. It, it rewarded me because it, it, the nostalgia of Christmas, but yes, the, you, you, you just present it differently. People appreciate it. And, and, and for me to be here to talk about Christmas and from the last day I was presenting it, it's, it's touching where food does bring people together and, and heal. And, it's been, it's been a blessing just being true to yourself and true to cooking it from your heart and that's what christmas is about for me and me as a chef and royce and everybody could see that where when you look at a dish you just compose it in your head and you just it doesn't matter what the course is you just want to make it do it right and and that's how it's been for me and um Apart from being in the Caribbean of, of Christmas, I mean, also, my grandma was doing like, what I have, have to have a fish option on the table. And you go to the local fisherman and get the biggest fish possible. And I would look at it as being the crown of the table next to the meat, the lamb, like a great fish. And from Christmas last year, where I tried to interpret that same model my, my grandma had, always have a fish option on the table. I actually decided to do a, a stuffed red snapper with um with um crab meat. I mean, we talk about creme la creme where red snapper crab meat for Christmas. You can't go wrong. That's like a gift itself. <laughs> <laughs> and and for me, it's just again refining cooking. And I actually wanted to show how I like to eat, and I just want to share that with people. And I actually had to deborn the whole fish because I want people to enjoy that stuffing with the crab with flawlessly and and doing plain flavors with sorrel and, and, and Creole sauces for fish. I just wanted to elevate it and I, I felt passionate and proud that, you know, it was received well where it received so well where I looked at it when you treat to yourself, you never know what comes. You rip the rewards later on, and me being here on this panel is it's it's a, it's a testimony of what you are to yourself. And I mean, I'm not sure what I say, but actually, the Food Network magazine saw that from last year, and they wanted to offer that, and it was like, wow, you got to be true to yourself. Like maybe some people have different styles, but nice thing works for everybody. And just being part of the offering your version of Christmas holidays is a blessing. 
Thank you, thank you. Yeah, you can hear the love behind all of your cooking and yeah. all of your dishes and the thoughts that goes into each of your foods. Um, Chef Ralston, uh, it's your turn. What is that unique that unique dish from the holidays that you are preparing? Um, What's the so, sauce? What's the? <laughs> no, no, I don't have I'll any do. of that. What I what I do have is the search for that. Um, so growing up, vegetarian, growing up in kind of like a box almost, you know, you, you can have this, you can't have that. And so I kind of grew up on smells, you know, you kind of knew what your, uh, what your buddy was, uh, your good friend was having for dinner based on the smell or what he's having for Christmas. You can smell the burning up the sugar and the onions and the caramelization of everything. And that kind of like, you understand he's having stew chicken or, or that kind of uh, thing or you smell the codfish just hitting the pan and you're boiling the codfish and the onions and the garlic and all that and then you know like like just the sounds and all that for me growing up it was really just whatever we grew so you know the eggplants and the the black eyed peas that we have or, or, or the pigeon peas we would shell it until our fingers were like brown right and, and and prepare that kind of stew stew peas there. Um, it's kind of simple and clean, and kind of like prideful based on the fact that we grew it right. Um, when I came to the states, um, that was I still remember it was uh, 1987 when I came came to the states, and I met my dad. My mom ate meat, and they were preparing all these meats, and so my dad would always take me to the butcher shop. He would go to the butcher shop, get like a chuck steak or something like that, not a real expensive cut. And then he'll take it home, he'll set it up, and then he'll leave it. And then he'll go maybe to his buddy's house, drink rum or whatever, leaving me to take care of it, right? And then, you know, the idea of like making that, finishing what my dad started, also extends to Thanksgiving. He never finished the turkey. He would go to all his friend's house, do their turkey. I'll be the one to finish it. And so maybe two and a half years later, I lost my dad. My dad was murdered. And so so after all of that happened, uh, for holidays, you have to understand that that's, that's where people sometimes, a way to reclaim your lost loved ones by making something that they loved or, or, or making grandma's grandma's fish or grandma's uh, whatever, or your past uncle, especially around this time during the COVID time and the pandemic where we everyone has lost someone. And, and, and I, I often say to my people, I said every day after, let's say every day after, let's say February, whatever, 16th or what have you, when, when the pandemic started kicking up in March, but all the way down, it's a memorial for someone who's lost someone. And so like, that's where I guess Christmas has totally changed and evolved now for many of us here in the States and in the islands, mostly in the States, um, to have totally different meanings. Uh, it's a way to reconnect and hold on to those that you've lost through food, right? Mm. So, so that's where we are. We, um, so, so even the way I cook my food, it comes from, a way of searching. Even I don't. I wasn't raised cook eating food or traditional Caribbean food. I always desired it. So normally, whatever I make is based on my interpretation of it. From being a little kid who would go to a wedding and you have the kalu soup, but kalu soup had a little piece of beef in the bottom, right? That no one knew about. My aunt didn't know it was there. And so, like, I would have, like, four or five cups of it. And that was my way of getting a little piece of taste of the meat, right? <laughs> or, you know, or, like, the or like the, the cake where you go and you have, like, the black cake. And it's in this white box. And it's a little teeny piece. And all those little tastes and little things. So I search for all of that. That's what drives my food. I, I basically cook based on the search and the search and the drive for tradition. And I don't consciously try to elevate it. It's just my interpretation of it. And somehow I do find a lot of pride in Caribbean food. I do think that we we somehow sell it cheap. You know, um, I think even like 
I mean, I'm a little off topic, but really like something that really irks me is like roti. A roti should be like, should be like $15 starting. Like you go somewhere, you put all that work into it and someone sells like eight bucks or something. I was like, you know, like I always pay my $15, my, especially for a good roti. I don't care how much it is because it's just like, if, if it was some other cuisine, it would be elevated in such a way where you be you put a roti on the thing. It'll be like, I mean, there's goat in there. There's there's all that. Just the roti alone, it's like eight bucks. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like that kind of thing. Where it's now you go to the store, it's being sold for a dollar fifty or two dollars or what have you for just the skin for the skin. And it's just we have to get to the point where the same people that come to our countries and enjoy our beaches in our land and, and try the food and then they come back up and they don't give us the uh, the credit and elevate as much we need to fight for that and that's and that's how that's where i am i got off topic but yeah no into the conversation as well though and deepest condolences on the loss of your father um and two for highlighting the fact that during the pandemic it's been a lot of memorials and the way in which sometimes we um we respond to that or recognize the, the members of our families or the people that we have lost is in food and, and sharing that and kind of remembering those recipes and things like that. So I appreciate too yeah. your thoughts on, you know, that you're in the search um, and that in that search yeah. you're finding creative ways to highlight and feature Caribbean food because it's your interpretation. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So some, one of our questions um, is from the audience, what makes each country's Black cake unique. I know some of you did mention black cake is one of the feature, <laughs> feature um, holiday traditions or foods that's on, on the table. Um, and then also the question asks, and does the U.S. have their own version of black cake? Hmm. Well, I can actually, um, you know, contribute to this question somehow. Um, growing up in Dominica and seeing the construction of the black cake from its onset to, to the end. I can tell you one of the um, ingredients, the key ingredients in the black cake in Dominica is the ruby rich wine. Mm. Ruby rich wine. Um, It's a wine that's like a port wine, but it's absolutely incredibly amazing. The flavors, um, it jumps right at you. And I think that wine combined, you know, with the fruits and it's dried fruits as well as you know, raisins and currants and, and, and stuff like that to give it that, that rich, um, fruity flavor. And again, we don't call it black cake in Dominican, we say fruit cake. So, um, but I'm not sure if there is an equally amazing version, which the U.S. You know, I'm just saying, I'm just saying U.S. fruit cake. And um, it's quite questionable. Um, it's not, well, I'm not, I'm not criticizing it in any way, but I'm saying that the comparison may not hold. And I think yeah. there would be some type of cultural appropriation there or some type of, I shouldn't call it cultural appropriation, but I, I would say there could be some um, inspiration, you know, using our black cake as a baseline to help develop a black cake here. Okay. Yeah. Or fruit cake. Yeah. Black coming fruit cake to the US. We have a fruit cake, but it's nothing like the black cake. Thanks yeah. to my team here, I've tasted Barbados's black cake. Yeah. I have not tasted anything like it. It's very in your face. It was good, delicious, but I have not tasted a cake like that in the U.S. More of our traditions are like pound cake. Yes. And one yeah. more thing, sorry, I forgot to add. Mm-hmm. Combined with that, also the soaking of the fruits. Fruits can be soaked up beyond, you know, a year also. I mean, my mom would have batches, right, yeah. from different periods, and they'll be labeled. So there's yeah. a meticulousness to this whole fruitcake experience. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there is a lot of bad black cake out there too, I must say, you know, like I've had. <laughs> so it's the idea of like, so for me, my thing is I've always, I, there's not, well, I shouldn't say I did bad. There's not a black cake that I really kind of like don't like, you know, like, you know, it may be like, okay, well, I wish it was like this way, but I still eat it, right? So everyone has their own thing and everyone thinks their black cake is the best, right? Um. Every time you say, hey, man, my aunt makes this amazing black cake and everyone brings me black cake. So that's why I have all these fruits. Like I started putting these fruits together just when I opened up the restaurant and which was uh, about like seven years ago, what have you. 
and I started planning to make this cake, but then people just keep bringing me cake, and I just haven't. So I just keep pouring rum on it, <laughs> keep pouring rum on it, rum. So actually, there's some out of the bottle now, but it's because I gave some. My sous chef asked me for some. I gave her some, just so that she could make her own. And then when she made the cake, she gave me a cake, so I don't need to make a cake. So like, I, everyone's making black cake everywhere. That's the thing. Everyone, you can go to people's houses and, and taste the black cake. But for me, I don't know. I'm not versed enough to understand. I always thought black cake and fruit cake were kind of like the same. Just that the the black cake has like the brown uh, the brown sugar or the browning in it or something like that. Um, in that sense, the same. In the states, of course, there's that fruit cake that everyone acts like they hate. And they put like, because they have a bunch of nuts in there, like pecans and all this other thing, like a, a ton of mixed peels and all that. We don't, I don't love it, but I'll eat it. You know, like, so everyone always thinks I'm weird for eating it. And I was like, but people are making it. They make it a lot in the States. It's in, it's, it's yeah. in every store, but it has Nobody's like this connotation where it's just, oh, fruitcake, that's horrible. You give that to people you hate, but every year it's being made and it's a lot of it. So there's gotta be some people that actually kind of like it. I mean, I don't... I don't hate it, but you know, I, I mean, it's not my go-to. But yeah, so black <laughs> cake and black, to 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 answer the question there, I think uh, everyone's ev everyone has a certain influence, and in, and it also has to do with like what you have around your house or what essential things you have. Like maybe people may be uh, more citrus forward, some people may be mixed peel forward, which is technically citrus as well. Uh, some people may be more currants or more cherry or more plums or what have you, you know, like whatever it is that that you have that you put in there it becomes your signature way of making it. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if I answered the question. But... You did, you did. Okay. Yes, you did. <laughs> you did. yes. Um Chef Ron, did you want to give any insights on if you've seen any different variations of black cake? I, I could put it inside. I'm not a pastry chef, but I think from seeing my grandmother growing up with her, it's I think two things that would be that kind of put an identity to your fruit, your black cake. And one of them is the rum. I guess based on the country you're ironing from, the rum that you use is the fermentation and also I would say the essence. Oh. Nice. I think the essence is how you make it in terms of how concentrated it is, it has a distinctive flavor that adds to the to the black cake. And I think that's the win there for me too, is the, the origin of the essence. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, I agree. It has a different yeah. profile. Yeah. So that would be distinguished for me. That's and Simon, I want to add to that. It has to be moist. You can't yeah. have dry black cake. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. 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 Okay, there's consensus there. No yes. dry black cake. But not too puddingy, not too puddingy. You know, like no, 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 no pudding. The right consistency. It has to have the right consistency. Yeah. Agreed. Wow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's nothing. Uh, there's nothing that's so sad than a dry black cake. Like wow. it's really sad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> Don't mess because up black cake because it can't be avoided. Oh yeah, you just soak it with some. Yeah, rum, rum wine, or pour, or, yeah, something like that, and it's and it's fine. It lasts yes. forever. Yes, <laughs> it does last forever. Okay. I had wedding cake, black cake, well, fruit cake, wedding cake for ten years. On my ten year anniversary, I pull out the cake oh, and wow. had it. Yeah, yeah, and it was yeah, yeah. good. Well, just fresh look, see? It's great. Wow. It's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that'll be my challenge: is to make it to every one of your prospective hometowns and get some black cake. <laughs> to try. Um, <laughs> yeah. So our time is like winding, winding down. Um, but I did want to make sure I gave each of you an opportunity to kind of talk about um, some of, and as one of our viewers is saying, fruits are very important. <laughs> the black what cake conversation. They said fruits are very important. <laughs> yes. Fruits are key, yes, yes. yes. Yeah, but I want to at least be able to kind of give our viewers an opportunity to hear kind of what you all are up to now. Um, and also, if you could kind of share how you pivoted during this pandemic um, 
um, in terms of like what you're doing now. So uh, Mayma, I'll go ahead and start with you. If you could kind of just sure. give some of your last remarks um, and thank you again for tuning in you all to this session. Go ahead, Mayma. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, um, cooking is definitely my passion. I really enjoy it. And of course I have to feed my family. So it's, it's kind of that, you know, that track that I can't avoid. Yeah, absolutely. It creates a great balance. Um, I do work outside of my home in tech and I do have a very busy schedule, but I make sure that I document my cooking and I certainly document and I curate a lot of the traditional Dominican dishes as well as some fusion blends. I have been documenting this on my blog, Dominica Gourmet, since during the pandemic. I was fortunate to find my people, Dominicans, in my Dominica food group. And I have to say that they have been so supportive and just helping to, you know, me to enhance and, you know, um, elevate our Dominican cuisine. And I'm so grateful for this. And I've often been asked, you know, am I going to open a restaurant? I used to own a business, of course, in New York. Um, before I moved to California. And it was really a lot of work to, to be there, you know, 24 seven to manage the business and make sure things are going great because I'm a stickler for details. But um, I see that, you know, I have young kids, so it's really challenging right now for me to do a restaurant and also um, manage my family. So with the encouragement of the Dominica Food Group on Facebook, um, you know, and also my Instagram and Facebook page, I have been asked to to write a book and I will, yes, I am so excited. Um, I started this, you know, fall trying to create the book. I'm going to be creating a wonderful a Caribbean recipe book with a strong, um, you know, centralized on Dominican cuisine and Dominican cooking. And, and like what Sean Ralston said, you know, trying to help elevate our Caribbean cooking and our cuisine because of course, um, we are the ones at the forefront and we need to to help make that transition and, and put our food on the mainstream. So that's what I'm doing. So next year, hopefully to be published. Um, in <laughs> All right. I ready. Keep an eye out for Mama's book. Yes. Yeah, so excited. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so, Sean, did you have any last minute remarks um, or just want to share kind of what you're up to, if anything shifted since the pandemic or what you're doing this this, this holiday time? Um, sure, I'd love to share something. I mean, based on me, again, the whole pandemic and where I was furloughed from my job and me pivoting, it was just, it was almost like a point of not stopping what the pandemic is doing. I didn't want it to win. And I just wanted to, I always say to myself, there's always small battles. It's always the small battles that counts. And not just allowing the pandemic to hold me down in terms of preventing me as a chef to grow. And it started with me cooking online on Instagram and people saying I needed that, needed that. And that actually forced me to do a lot of pop-ups, private chef. And again, it's just me serving the community. And with this whole puddle of, going through the whole pandemic and just me doing a lot of pop-ups and it, it had, it made me prove a, a proven concept where I wanted to show the community where Caribbean cuisine could be on a refined level and also a quote unquote healthy approach in, in, in essence. And I am hopefully I'm close to it. I'm gonna open my own um, takeout concept and it's it's going to feature my style of cooking, which is called New Age Caribbean Cuisine, and it's going to be special. And I'm going to again, I'm going to cook from my heart, and just the same way I want to show what Caribbean cuisine could be on a on a on a refined level. I just want to continue that and look out for it. I'm going to, it's going to be called Fat Fowl. It's going to be downtown Brooklyn at the City Point Building. I will be checking it out when I'm in New York for sure. <laughs> I know I gotta make it to New York just so I can check it out. <laughs> it, it's, yeah. it's, I've been cooking for 11 years and, and and you know sometimes you aim so high of what you want but being the pandemic happened it just shows you 
you know what? Yeah, you could aim high, but it brings you where you need to be. And I'm, I'm humble and feel proud. And I just want to make the community proud and just share my love with the community. It's, I want to take that responsibility. And again, just being here is great. And being on this panel, it just shows, you know what? You're on the right path to where you need to be. And I mean, I just feel proud of what I've done and how I took on the pandemic. And it didn't, it didn't, I didn't let it beat me. I, as I said, every small win is great and I'll take them. And it's, it led me to this, so it's awesome. And I want to feature this. It's a cookbook, it's a Food Network magazine, which is my recipe in here for Christmas time. It's just part of the small wins, the small wins you get with the battle. So I just want to say, I just want to make the Caribbean community proud and again, be true to myself and be here with you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chef Sean. That is awesome. So we also got another feature to look out for in the Food Network. That's great. And congratulations on your restaurant too. Chef Ross. Yeah, congrats. <laughs> hey. Um, so, 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 so I've had a restaurant called the Food Sermon for many years. Um, I closed it maybe a couple months ago. Um, it's all connected to, of course, the pandemic, but also a move that I made to... Um, to it's a big project and we went into this whole idea of like doing uh fast casual style but of course if you're in an office building 16 stories everyone's working from home no one is there before the pandemic i was planning my retirement because <laughs> it, it was doing so well and then after the pandemic uh started hitting you understand that hey man uh this may not work out you know so much takeout you can do there's only so much takeout you can do I mean, however um throughout my whole career of being on the food scene i never intended to accomplish any of this for me it was all about being able to take care of my family being able to help to pay a bill or two right it was never to be on any type of stage or anything like that. It wasn't even, it was not even, to be honest, it was not even about elevating Caribbean cuisine. It was just really about just being myself, being able to, and I always say, you know, whatever I do, I ask myself, is it necessary or is it ego? Um, I can't defend ego, I can defend the necessary. And so with Caribbean food, it's birthed from a place of necessity, right? Uh, our forefathers and foremothers who just kind of like just use what we had to create and feed our families, right? So that's kind of like what has happened. And so now that it's closed, I have to keep that same energy that I had when things were kind of like going well or what have you. Um, that now we had to close. Uh, I was really more concerned about my employees than myself, right? So, but they're all okay, right? Um, at the end of the day, um, what's on the horizon would be, you know, I've signed a book deal uh, and, and, and so, and I signed this book deal a while ago. It's gonna be called Caribbean Cookbook, right? It's a, with a publisher named Fiden who does what's called cooking Bible. So, at the end of the day, they have like Japan and they have like Cuba and they have America and other uh, Mexico and those other um, cuisines. And I'm going to be doing the Caribbean version of that book, right? And so I'm doing that and I'm also doing a lot of, um, if you go on YouTube or anything like that, uh, you, uh, I do a lot of stuff with Bon, with bon Appetit and Epicurious and do a lot of uh, cooking and instructional videos there. Um, and then when it warms up, we'll get back to the food sermon and doing a lot more pop-ups and wherever God leads, that's where we'll end up. You know, if he says, no, don't open, you don't open. So you just keep that same energy that you've had all along. Yeah. Very nice. Congratulations, too. I can't wait to, to see this book and your feature and highlighting. I'm going to need some help. I'm going to need some help from Mayma and John. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you.
you all so much. Um, I've truly enjoyed hearing just some of your traditions um, with the holidays and your upbringing. Um, that was super touching and you all just sharing some of those intimate moments um, from your childhoods and the transition from the pandemic and how you all have been navigating that as well. I really appreciate um, the consensus and the feature of uh, community and how some of the food from the Caribbean has come out of necessity. Um, I see the linkages too in my own background and Southern um, inspirations from my family migrating to the, the North and to the necessity of that was created out of food that they were providing um, for myself and my family. So thank you all again um, for participating in this session and Caribbean American cuisine and the holiday times. Um, thank you to our viewers today for tuning in. We truly appreciate it and truly appreciate your comments and your shout outs to all of the chefs and cooks we featured today. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon or morning from wherever you all are today. Um, and thank you again for tuning in. All right, everybody take care so and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Happy holidays. Right. Happy holidays, everyone. Yeah.